but thou art strong. Jesus, take me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk, let me walk close to thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Jesus is my plea, daily walking close to Thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be, through this world of toil and snares, if I falter, Lord, who cares? But they just a closer walk with thee. Grant if Jesus is my place. Thank you, Lord, that we can get close to you if we want to. Lord, a lot of times we should and we don't. I pray you just get close to us this morning, God. Help us to see what you'd have us to see in your word. And God, help remind us of these things. God, they have a, a great influence on our life if we remember what you said. I pray the Lord Jesus Christ will be uplifted and glorified. And Lord, most of all, we pray that you'll, God, come and get us. You said... If I come again, God, and uh, you didn't put a day on it, Lord, but I hope it's today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, y'all. I was once a sinner, but I came, pardon to receive from my Lord. He was freely given, and I found that he always kept his word. There's a new name breaking out in glory, and it's fine, oh yes, it's fine. And the white robed angels sing the story. A sinner has come home, for there's a new name breaking out in glory, and it's fine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. I was humbly kneeling at the cross, fearing not but God's angry crowd. When the heavens opened, and I saw that my name was written down, there's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine, oh yes it's mine, and the white robed angels in the story, a sinner has come home, there's a new name written in glory, and it's mine, oh yes it's mine, with my sins forgiven I am bound for heaven, never more to Oh, the joy that came to my soul. Now I am forgiven, and I know 
by the blood I am made of. There's a new name bringing in glory, and it's mine, oh yes it's mine. In the white road angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. There's a new name bringing in glory, and it's mine, oh yes it's mine. Forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to run. Preacher, brother. Yep. <laughs> All right, turn to Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15. We're preaching a lot of the Proverbs and Psalms, but I get them where God gives them to me. This is an old street preaching verse that I've preached many, many, many times. I used to preach in front of the Rosie O'Grady's downtown when I was in Bible school, and then when I went to work with Brother Bill, we preached in Milton. Uh, back in those days, about the only thing to preach in front of was the Piggly Wiggly <laughs> on Saturday. That's about the only place where the people were. Uh, Sunday they were down at the park, but you went to church on Sunday, so you had to catch them at the pig. Um, Proverbs 15, verse number 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Heavenly Father, help us now. As we study about you watching us and how that can affect our lives and affect our lives, Lord. And, and I pray you just help us, Lord, to realize this every moment every, of every day that you're watching what we do. And you're going with us where we go, Lord. Help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's an old song that uh, a fellow I knew, Bill Wagner, he became a pastor up in West Virginia. But him and another fellow would get up at Bible school and they would sing this old song, and I have never seen a copy of it or heard the music or anybody else sing it, but it was called There's an Eye in the Sky Watching You. And at the chorus, he goes, watching you and you and you and you and you and watching you and you and you and you. And that's always stuck in my mind, especially this verse here. It's based on this verse here. Uh, now, this, if I wanted to get real theological, I would say I'm going to preach on the omni omniscience of God or omniscience of God if you want to break the word down uh, in Job, the book of Job uh, Job said this now Job is the first book ever written in the Bible and so he, he's the first guy that got a revelation that got wrote down and it's amazing that Job said this in the book of Job he said God understandeth the way thereof and he knoweth the place thereof for he looketh to the ends of the earth and seeth under the whole heaven so God knows everywhere in the universe. He knows everything and he sees everything. So if there's a little birdie somewhere in the jungle over there in Africa or Australia somewhere on the outback or, uh, you know, and he falls from a tree, God knows exactly where that is and what happened, what time of day it happened. He saw it happen. He sees past, present, and future. Now, mankind, we've tried, we've tried the same thing. Uh, at NASA, they have a program called the EOS, which stands for Earth Observing System, which is kind of nifty. Um, and they've been putting these satellites up in space. This system comprises of satellites designed for global observation. That, that should kind of cause you to work, because they got some satellites can... I mean, they, they zoom down in there. If you're holding a magazine uh, in, in your hands, they might be able to read the headlines in the magazine quite big enough. Certainly a newspaper, they could read the banner of the newspaper. I've seen pictures of this. Uh, the first kind of satellite in this uh, system, now many of the satellites in this system have come and gone, but the first one they ever put up was in 1966. They put up the weather sat. Uh, com, which was the AT-53, uh, and that's what date it was launched, in 1966 on December 7th. 
And since that time, now it was very simple. It basically had a camera, a video camera, very early video camera, and it kept track of all the cloud movements. And so that's when you began to see th stuff on TV. I remember, I remember in the early 70s, they had the, the weather people, and it was very crude. They would, they would show you a picture from space, and you really had to look hard to say, well, is that the United States? Are we looking at, where are we looking at here, China? It was hard to tell. But as the years have gone by, uh, they've set up sat satellite and satellite. Presently, they have 10 active satellites that observe all kinds of things. One wonders what they observe, really. But they, they, they look at the Earth and they look at what's going on at the Earth. Uh, they even have a, a, a science program on discovery, uh, I think, uh, that's called What in the World? And most of the time... They, they introduce the thing, well, this satellite saw this, and what in the world is that? Because sometimes when you look at something from space, it don't look the same as when you're on the ground. And so they kind of, uh, some of this stuff looks kind of strange. And so they go and explore, and they find out what this stuff is. Well, God don't need any satellite. He don't need uh, to watch the clouds. He don't need to watch uh, uh, spy on you because God is omniscient and he sees everything everywhere, every place and everybody. So that brings me to my first point this morning, the eyes of the Lord. Now, when you're making a sermon, this is just a little side. You want to answer some basic questions. In an English class, uh, they'll give you this same uh, list. Who, what, why, when, and sometimes how, and where. Who, what, why, when, where, and how. So the eyes of the Lord answer two questions. What and who? They're not your eyes, they're God's eyes. So right immediately, we're talking about a supernatural thing here. Um, I saw something on the internet the other day. It was rather silly. It was how to spot hidden cameras in your house. And it had this little picture of some guy with a magnifying glass. And he was looking inside his uh, uh, fire uh, smoke detector thing in his house. Look, you know, why would anybody that's a human being really want to spy on you? Or on me, for instance. I mean, it'd be the most boring thing in the world. There's some people watching TV for an hour, you know, or eating supper. Uh, you think of all the billions of people on the planet, there's probably a little tiny sliver of those people you might want to spy on that do stuff really important. You know, like the guy who carries the little nuclear suitcase button around with the president. You know, I'd never spy on him. But other than that, I wouldn't even bother spying on the president. Because most of the time he's in his office or on TV and, and most people know where he's at and what he's doing. But when God watches you, he watches you, uh, well, he, he, he watches everything about how you do things. Uh, 1 Kings, if you want to turn there, 1 Kings 15, verse 5. And this, this phrase in 1 Kings 15, verse 5, is repeated throughout the Old Testament when it's talking about the kings. And I want you to note this phrase. And I want you to wonder... If, if God wrote the story of your life, would he say this about you? Because it's really important. 1 Kings 15, 5. Because David, King David, you remember King David, uh, did that which was right. All right, that's fine. You, he could have stopped there. But he said, right in the eyes of the Lord and turn not aside from anything. That he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So God says, look, David obeyed me. He lived a good life. And God knows what he's talking about because he was watching David. And of course he gives the exception that 
that David messed up when it came to Uriah the Hittite. You remember what he did? He, he lusted after Bathsheba. Bathsheba was married to Uriah the Hittite. And the army was fighting. And so uh, he got Uriah the Hittite to come home on a furlough. And, and he, could, he couldn't get him in to go see his wife. And, and she was pregnant. And, and so eventually what he did was he wrote Joab a letter and said, Look, put him in the hottest part of the battle and make sure that he dies. So he murdered him by proxy. He didn't actually take a gun or a knife or a spear and kill Uriah the Hittite, but he had him killed. And God was watching that. And God held David accountable for that. All the bad things that happened to David in his life after that, there's all kinds of them. He even had to go running for his life <clears throat> because his son tried to take over the kingdom. So God is watching us everything that we do. I wonder if God would save us. He did that was his right in the eyes of the Lord. He's probably going to have a lot of caveats with me. Except in the case of this and this and this and this and this. I'm just a human. Second Chronicles 16 verse 9. Um, if you want to turn there, it talks about the eyes of the Lord. Um, look. This is a real thing. We don't see the eyes of the Lord, but they're there. Matter of fact, this, this is uh, very strong, what this verse says. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. So God's all the time looking at everything. He, 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 everywhere you are, he, he's making sure he observes you. Ah, uh, he, he's scanning the planet. He's scanning the planet. To show himself strong, now look, in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. So God is looking for those that are right with him, and if they get into any trouble, God's looking out for them. Now that's a good thing. You ought to praise God for that. All his saved children, he looks out for. I had been on the road before and had God look after me. Sometimes when I'm, uh, last Sunday we were running real late. And I, I was a little perturbed. And God reminded me that may, maybe I'm missing an accident down the road or something. See, you, you can't get aggravated sometimes. Even though things not, not going your way. Maybe God's preventing you from being in an accident somewhere or some, some place you shouldn't be. Because there's people that have been in places they shouldn't have been. And if they had been delayed just two or three minutes, they'd have missed out. Some of them have died. Look what it says. It says, Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore thenceforth thou shalt have wars. So it, it says God is looking Scanning the earth for those that hearts are good. But then he's noticing the foolish ones too. And he says, God God knows your faults. And, and, and basically, this verse is saying, okay, God sees that. And, and, and you're not repenting of it. And God knows all about it. And God's going to make you pay for it. Because he sees everything. Our faults and our good things. Um, there's an astronomer named... Samuel Alfred Mitchell. He was born in 1874 and he died in 1960. This was a man that was nearly, nearly, nearly 100 years old. And he was an astronomer. And he was one of the foremost astronomers in America. Uh, even though he was born overseas. And one day he had set this big telescope up. And one of his main things was observing the sun. And so he had the, his telescope trained on the sun, and he was watching it set in the west. And he kept lowering the thing as the sun got lower and lower and lower and lower. And finally, uh, the sun sank beneath the horizon, and he, it, it slipped down a little lower, and he looked through it just to see what it was looking at. And he saw a couple miles distance, he saw some boys uh, up in a tree, and they were stealing apples out of this guy's tree. <laughs> this guy's tree. Well, 
uh, they thought, you know, one guy was kind of in the lower part of the room, and he was looking around to make sure they didn't get caught. Well, uh, Professor Mitchell, um, he wrote a little note and sent it off by messenger to the guy on the orchard, and, and the boys got caught. <laughs> and they were surprised. He says, how come we got caught? He says, well, the professor was over here with his telescope watching the sun, and he saw you. He saw us. Yeah, he saw you. Don't think God is oblivious to anything you do. And see, we get that in our mind. We say, well, I'll just do this. No, no one will ever know. Uh, oh, yeah, they will. <laughs> God knows. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding uh, the evil and the good, beholding, beholding. That's what God does. He beholds it. Um, beholding is just more than just looking at something. It's paying attention to it. Um, if I say, behold, the eraser, everybody looks this way. Or if I say, behold, you're going to look and see what I got in my hand. And you're going to pay attention to it. God beholds everything, every place. Proverbs 5.21 says, for the ways of man... Does that include you? Yeah, it includes you. Are before the eyes of the Lord. He pondereth all his going. So not only does God see you do something, but he can sit and he ponders it. And God can do that because God sees what's in your heart. And God sees what's in your brain. He knows your thoughts. And so, uh, look, there's a difference between um, doing something by accident and doing something on purpose. Um, like if you uh, you borrow something and you're using whatever it is and it breaks while you're using it. That's an accident. But if you borrow something from somebody because you're jealous that they have it, and then you decide, well, I can't afford one, I'm going to break this, and then both of us won't have it. See, that's, that's a bad thing. And people do that kind of thing. I wonder sometimes, well, I've loaned stuff out. I don't loan much of anything out anymore. I, uh, I've loaned record sets that never came back. I've loaned, uh, I've loaned tools that never came back. Um, you know, sometimes I let people borrow my car in the past, and, and I really uh, was concerned about whether they were going to come back or not. Or at least come back in one piece. God's in heaven in every place. So some little fellow walking down a road in red China right now. Or, or, or on, the, on the back side of a, a Russia somewhere. Or, or down in South Africa. Or, or over in England. Or, or over in the western part of the United States. Or up in Canada. Or way down in South America. God sees that person. He knows what they're doing. And why they're doing it. Zechariah 4, verse 10, says, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. There the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro throughout the earth. Zechariah had a vision. And he had a vision of these plumb bobs. And, and what a plumb bob does is it measures the uprightness of something. Because a plumb bob is a heavy object that hangs from a string. Usually it's got a point on the end of it. And it's, it's appointed by gravity to hang straight down. Uh, it doesn't ever hang at an angle. So you hold it up against something and you can see where it's perpendicular to the gravity of the planet. And that's important when you're building a tower or building a wall or anything that has to stand up by itself. You need to measure it and make sure it's where it should be. Uh, this is how we got things like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I, I mean, just things weren't quite right. There's a little poem about God judging even the smallest things. It says, don't despise the day of small things. Sometimes people think they'll get by with it because it's a it's just a small thing. I'll just tell that little fib 
to the preacher. I, I, well, you know, no one will. Oh, they mischanged me at the grocery store. Well, they'll never miss 17 cents. You better go back and give them that 17 cents. God's a looking. A little poem. He was just a little lad. And on the week's first day, was wandering home from Sunday school and dwaddling along the way. He scuffed his shoes into the grass. He found a caterpillar. He found a fluffy milkweed pod and blew out all the filler. A bird's nest in a tree overhead, so wisely placed and high, was just another wonder that caught his eager eye. A neighbor watched his zigzag course and hailed him from the lawn and asked him where he had been that day and what was going on. Oh, I have been to Sunday school, he carefully turned a sod and found a snail beneath it. I learned a lot about God. Mmm, a very fine way, said the neighbor. For a boy to spend his time. If you'll tell me where God is, I'll give you a brand new dime. Quick as a flash, his answer came. Nor were his accents faint. He says, I'll give you a dollar, mister, if you'll tell me where God ain't. God's everywhere. And he's looking at you. He's a looking at us this morning. He's a looking at somewhere sitting in their house that's supposed to be here this morning. Or wherever they're at. So the eyes of the Lord. Then he's beholding. And you know the Bible says he's beholding. What is he beholding? The evil and the good. Turn to Psalm 33. Turn to Psalm 33. Now this one you ought to memorize. This one you ought to memorize. It's an easy verse to memorize. You could probably memorize Proverbs 15.3. But Psalm 33 verse 13 says, The Lord looketh from heaven and beholdeth all the sons of men. The Lord looketh from heaven and beholdeth all the sons of men. Now, Proverbs Says he beholds the evil and the good. Well, you know, where are the evil and the good? Um, now, I know the word evil can mean a bad thing. Uh, you know, like a, 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 a maybe a dead animal on the side of the road. You could say that's evil because it smells bad. you got an evil smell. But that's not the kind of evil God's talking about. He's talking about sinfulness here. Where does that come from? Uh, and the things you do. The things you do. That's, that's the why of why God looks at you all the time and he sees everything. Well, first of all, let's look at the evil. He, he sees the evil and the good. He sees the evil first. Uh, 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9, we already read that verse. Uh, talks about wherein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from thence thou shalt have wars. So God's telling this king, look, you haven't done the right thing, you've done a foolish thing, and because you've done this foolish thing, you're going to pay for it. God makes sure that the evil things that people do, they get paid for. They get paid for. Oh, there's a lot of people that cheat and lie and steal and do all kinds of things, and they don't think God's paying attention to it. Some Christian people do that. Uh, but you know what? God always makes sure that they pay for it. I've seen that through the years. I really have. I've seen people... Look, we've had people in this church who have lived terrible lives Monday through Saturday and nobody knew about it. And then one day all of a sudden, plop, they're in jail for the next 15, 20 years. Said, how did that happen? Nobody knew about it. God did. God did. Look, uh, you, you might as well just make up your mind that no matter what evil things you do, no matter what hateful thoughts you have, God sees them and knows them, and you better repent of that thing and get it right and don't do that no more because God's going to make sure you pay for those things. I wonder sometimes about what kills people. 
Because, you know, they say, well, you know, uh, you know, so many people have died of COVID. You know, that's a virus. Uh, you know, some people die of heart attacks. But how do they get heart attacks? Well, they say, oh, they've eaten wrong or they've done, they haven't exercised enough. Yeah, but I've seen healthy people in the prime of life just keel over dead. What happened there? Well, there's a reason for that stuff. Anxiety, stress. What causes those things? Sometimes it's an external thing. But a lot of times it has to do with that person itself. There's something in their heart that, that, that man, they just, it's, it's, it's evil. 1 Peter 3.12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. God doesn't like evildoers. Say, well, why do evil people like Adolf Hitler and uh, dic evil dictators like we had in the last century, why, why, did God, why does God allow those people? Well, God's doing something. And sometimes he'll use the evil people to do it. But believe me, he's not really for those evil people. He's just using them because he doesn't want to use some good guy somewhere. He, he looks down at that guy's heart and he says, well, he's going to do that anyway. And I need to punish some people over here, so I'll send that fellow over there. Or I need to warn those people. Or I, I need to get these Christians excited about me and praying to me. Look, there's no better way to get Christians praying than to persecute them. In Africa right now, there are several countries that are on the brink of communist revolution. You know what's happened to the... Christian population in those countries, they're down on their knees and they're scared and they're praying with all their heart. I don't blame them. I don't blame them. God's got their attention. So not only does he see the evil, but he sees the good. Thank God he sees the good. Psalm 34, 5, 15. 30, Psalm 34, 15. I'll get it straight. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cries. So God looks and he sees when you pray. And he hears you when you pray. And he sees that motive in your heart. It's just not like the little kid. Lord, uh, Lord I want a bicycle so bad. But he sees you, you're praying. Oh, help, help this lady down the street, Lord. Her husband died. She's got two teenagers. She needs your help, Lord. So God sees that motive. That's a good motive. God sees that. He's keeping track of it. And I want to remind you of something. There are times in this life that you need to find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Some of you desperately need grace. I need it every day. So where do you find it? Well, Genesis 6, 8 says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Everybody on the whole planet except for Noah was doing bad and evil and sinning against God. And God looked that entire planet over. I don't know how many people were on the planet then, how, what the population of the globe was. But I know this, God looked through all of them and he found the one guy and he gave him grace. And he needed it because he had to build the boat. He had to get them animals in there. He had to get us. So he had to go out every day and preach to people that really didn't want to hear him preaching and try to get them right with God. So what, what kind of results did he have? He had his family. Nobody else. Nobody else. Unless you count the bugs and the skunks. Found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In Reader's Digest, some time ago, a lady reported an interesting experience. She telephoned her bank and attempted to correct an error which the bank had made on her statement. Her call was transferred from one person to another. You ever had that, you know, where you go from one guy to another guy to another guy? And he, she went from this office to that office to that office. And there was a lot of talk on each stop along the way, but nobody could help her. Finally, the eighth person she talked to proved to be 
calmly and sympathetically helpful. He was genuinely pleasant and thoroughly efficient, even friendly, and the, the business got done and the error was corrected. And when it was all done, the lady said, you're great. What is your position at the bank? And he said, oh, I'm the ungoofer. <laughs> I'm the ungoofer. Yeah. You need an ungoofer sometimes. You do. Because sometimes there's a mistake somewhere. There's something that shouldn't be there. So who's the ungoofer? God's the ungoofer. God's the ungoofer. I like that story. I'm the ungoofer. First Samuel 16. If you want to turn there, look at First Samuel 16. Verse number 7. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. Now, Samuel has been sent by God to pick out a new king. Saul was already the king, and he was kind of doing this on the sly. Because he didn't want Saul to catch him. Because if Saul had caught him, he probably killed him. And so he, he got sent down to Jesse's house, the Bethlehemite, and he's looking at all the, the boys. And the first guy comes along, and he's big and tall and handsome and strong. He says, oh yeah, that's a good king material. God said, nope, not him. Gets the next boy, nope, not him. Nope, not him. And finally, in verse number 7, the Lord tells Samuel something very important. It says, but the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, that's the outside, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth, not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. God not only sees all, he sees through all. He sees through you. He knows exactly who you are, what you think, what you are most of the day. And when we sin against God, we either forget this or intentionally ignore it. If you would keep this in mind every day, all the time, you would be a lot better, gooder, nicer, more efficient, and, and, and a more blessed Christian. Because your life would change. Now, I want to tell you something special about us. Now, Proverbs is in the Old Testament. Samuel's in the Old Testament. But we're New Testament Christians. And we're born again. And we have, we have something special. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 says this. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. You have God actually inside of you. And you carry him with you. So not only does he see what you do. He sees you. But he's in you. So. Have every place you've ever gone. Would you be ashamed to take Jesus there? Some people could say yes. Some people would say no. But if we could just get this thing of God's presence with us. And his eyes watching us, it would change our life. It would change our life. How easily we get caught up in this world and the, the hustle and the bustle and the, the, what we used to call it, the rat race. We forget that God's a looking. God's a looking. Every head bowed and every eye closed. We're not going to have piano. But I want everybody to, to think this morning and just take a few minutes and ponder. Was there anything yesterday? Let's just take one day, yesterday, that I did or I thought that I really wouldn't want God to see me do or think. 
Is there anything like that yesterday? Well, if there is, the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. To give, forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How about last week? How about last month? Every day we need to go to God and take a stock of our life. Trouble is we move so fast in this day and time, we don't hardly take stock of anything. We just move on. But Christian... It behooves us to take stock. We'll live a lot better life if we do. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray when folks get home that you'll just kind of put this little thing and bug in their ear that I'm a-watching, you're a-watching. You're going with them wherever they go. And God, I, I pray you that that will be an encouragement to them. And God, it will put, put the fear of God into them. And God, help them when they make decisions in their life. Maybe to slow down a little bit and pray and ask God's guidance. Because God, you're willing, you're able to help us. In any of life, and any of its good things or bad things, you're there, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for what you do, Lord. Help us every day to remember this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.